Hello and welcome everyone to our COVID-19 vaccine information session this evening. My name is Krista Danis, and I'm the events and program coordinator at the Aurora Public Library District. And I'm pleased to be joined tonight by Michael Isaacson, who is the assistant director for community health at the Kane County Health Department, who will be sharing valuable information about COVID-19 vaccine availability and safety here in Aurora and Kane County. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Michael. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. Sure, and thanks to everyone for tuning in from Zoom and Facebook Live. So before we get started, I just want to remind everyone there will be a Q&A at the end of Michael's presentation. So if you have not already submitted a question, please um, feel free if he does not answer your question during our session this evening, pop your question into the Q&A function on Zoom or you can use the comment section of Facebook I'll be checking those out, moderating them, and at the end, we'll kind of um, answer them as best as possible um, in our session this evening. So um, take it away, Michael. Great, thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking some time to, to join us tonight to talk about what's happening with COVID-19 vaccine here in Kane County. Uh, my name is Michael Isaacson, and um, I'm the Assistant Director of Community Health for the Kane County Health Department. And then I'm also going to be joined uh, my colleague, Kate McCormick, who is one of our Community Initiatives Coordinators, uh, is going to be conducting the, the Spanish session, which will be immediately following uh, this at 7 p.m. Uh, so just want to put out right at the beginning, uh, we appreciate what a frustrating time this is in the community. Uh, with the high demand for vaccine and, and the supply just not quite yet being there to be able to meet everyone's needs. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that right, right up front and, and say uh, we understand everyone's frustration. Uh, as soon as we get vaccine, we're getting it out into the community uh, as soon as we possibly can. We don't have any sitting around. So uh, I'll go through some, some information here tonight, which hopefully will, will shed a little light on it. Uh, but but just want to acknowledge up front that, that there's much higher demand for vaccine than we currently have supply. So I always like to start with a little bit of background information about just exactly what's happening with COVID in the community right now. Uh, so I'm going to show a, a couple of slides that have some statistics. Uh, on this first slide, you can see on the left, uh, there is information that shows uh, how much is um, out of every 100 tests that we administer, what percentage of those are coming back positive? Uh, so you can see here, and this is our most recent data that was just updated yesterday, in the Kane and DuPage region, so Kane and DuPage County, the state is put into a region that they call region eight. Uh, we have less than 5% of our tests coming back positive right now. Uh, I'm sharing a month's worth of data here, so you can see that's half as many tests coming back positive now as there were a month ago. So that's a great improvement. And if you remember, if you're tracking this sort of thing, uh, you'll recall that a couple of months ago, we were up at 15, 16%. So uh, we've dramatically improved and have less percentage of tests coming back positive. Over on the right-hand side of the screen is another measure that we look at, which is how many beds do we have available in our hospital uh, in the ICU. Our goal is to always maintain at least 20% of the beds available. You can see from this slide that over the past month, uh, we have had between 20 and 30% uh, of the beds available. So that's a good sign. We feel good about that capacity. This next slide represents hospitalizations in Kane and DuPage hospitals. Uh, so this is also showing pretty positive news that over the past month, we've had a relatively steady decline in the number of our residents uh, who are being hospitalized. So less positive tests are coming back. Uh, we have plenty of, of bed availability in our ICUs and we are seeing fewer people in our hospitals. So those are all very good signs. Unfortunately, we are still seeing um, too many deaths in our community. And this is, this is ultimately uh, the main thing that we're trying to stop. Uh, so you can see from this slide, uh, from about October on up into January, we had a pretty sharp increase in the number of deaths that were being reported in Kane County each week. 
Uh, we are optimistic over the last few weeks that we started to see a small decline. Uh, as a matter of fact, last week we had under 20 deaths, which unfortunately uh, we've reached a point where, where under 20 deaths in a week is, is an improvement compared to where we had been. Uh, but we're still losing far too many of our of our friends and family members to this disease. So uh, we want to make sure that we're taking appropriate precautions. Uh, and the, the purpose of this evening's conversation is to talk about vaccines, which we're very excited to finally have vaccine uh, available to us here and um, being distributed in Kane County. So here are a couple photos just of the first day when vaccine arrived. Uh, very exciting on December 16th. Uh, our first shipments of Pfizer vaccine showed up in our community. The state and the federal government have released guidelines around who should first be immunized. Uh, so the first group to, that we focused on was what we're calling Group 1A. Um, so Group 1A roughly breaks into two different, different categories. Uh, the first, the first por portion is healthcare workers. And on this slide, that's healthcare workers who can be in a hospital setting and a non-hospital setting. So we really focused on taking care of the people who are taking care of us uh, with the understanding that their jobs put them at higher risk of coming into contact with someone from, with COVID. So we wanna protect them. And then over on the right-hand side of the screen, you can say, see the second group that's in 1A and that is the long-term care facilities and other congregate care settings. Uh, so this is an area that we really wanted to focus on getting vaccine to first because this is uh, perhaps a place where people are more susceptible to illness because of the congregate nature. So more people living together increases risk, but then also there's increased risk of death in this population as well, uh, because age is a factor that, that relates to, to the number of deaths that we're seeing. Uh, so we actually have partnered and are part of the national pharmacy program that includes CVS and Walgreens, where they're actually going on site at our long-term care facilities, our skilled nursing facilities, and offering vaccine to both staff and the residents of those places. Uh, so as of this week, we've had over 6,000 doses of vaccine have been provided to this population. Uh, so that's very exciting to see that moving on. Currently in Illinois, we're in what we call phase 1B. And this is a very large category of people uh, and this group really breaks down to get on this list. There's two main ways people can get on the list. They can get on the list because of the risk of serious illness, uh, which is our older population. So for people 65 and over, uh, they are in the current 1B category because it's that 65 and older population where we have seen more serious illness, more hospitalizations and more death. Uh, nationally, in looking at some of the data, we originally started with 75 and over. Uh, because of some of the health inequities that we were seeing, where our Black and Latinx populations, people were dying at younger ages. Uh, so we were very glad to see in Illinois that they made this age 65 and over. You also can see that we have first responders, educators, the food and agriculture sector, manufacturing, corrections, the postal workers, public transit workers, grocery store workers, and shelter, shelters and adult daycare. So all of those positions, uh, we're looking at the frontline people who are providing essential services. They, again, we expect may be at a higher level of risk based on the type of work that they're doing, that they may be more likely to come in contact with somebody who's had COVID. So for the, for the senior population, we wanna take care of them because if they get exposed to COVID, there's higher risk. For the rest of the population, we want to take care of them because we think the nature of their job, or in the case of shelters and adult daycare, because of where they live or where they're spending time, there's increased risk of getting illness. Uh, there's a lot of debate at the national level about how we make these prioritizations. Uh, and again, I think there's, there's two simple ways to really look at this. Um, if you vaccinate the older population first, then the logic is that you may reduce deaths in your community. If you vaccinate the people who are more likely to get ill, uh, not only are you reducing deaths, and again, with health inequities that we're seeing, which I'll talk about later, uh, you're reducing death there, but you're also reducing the spread and reducing transmission in the community, which ultimately also will protect the population that's 65 and over. So that's why we're looking at both of these groups in 1B. Um, 
I know there's there's a lot of, of um, advocacy going on from each group that they want to be first within this within this category. Um, so we're trying to get vaccine out as quickly as we can to get to take care of people. We have 530,000 residents in Kane County. And in this priority group, we estimate that there is probably, uh, well, there's well over 100,000 people in this category. So it's going to take us some time to work through this. Uh, also, there's been some changes even since we put the slide deck together, uh, where the state's starting to take health um, consideration, health care issues into consideration. Uh, so if somebody has some, some risk factors due based on their health, that may now move them into 1B, which I think is a, a very positive move. So just quickly looking at how things have been going in terms of vaccines in Kane County, uh, just like the rest of Illinois, we are uh, really dependent on vaccine supply. So you can see that as the weeks have gone by, uh, the first week we, we focused on the, the medical community, second week we really focused on the medical community, and then now we've started to, to branch out into the 1B category. This orange line, depending on the size of the screen you're watching, uh, watching this on, maybe you can see it, but the orange line is the seven day average for the number of shots that we're giving a, each day in Kane County. Uh, as of today, we were up to averaging about 1,700 shots per day. Uh, with the size of our population, and taking into account that the two vaccines that we're currently using, Pfizer and Moderna, are both two-dose vaccines, we need to be doing much more than 1,700 shots a day. We need to be doing 3,000, 3,500, 4,000 or more each day. We do have the capacity to do many more shots based on the partners that we're currently working with. Uh, we just need the vaccine supply to show up in our community. Uh, to date, we have administered 40,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, as of today, we have received about 50,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, some of those we're distributing to community partners right now. Uh, the rest we're administering at, at clinics that the Kane County Health Department is running. So by the end of this week, we anticipate that we are not going to have uh, much vaccine that's left. And so we'll be waiting for our next shipment to come in. Uh, so that we can do this over again next week. I do like to draw people's attention to this website. Uh, this is the Illinois Department of Public Health website. This is where you can go. You can see how Kane County is doing. It's updated on a daily basis. Uh, I think this kind of transparency is really important so people can see uh, what's, what's happening in their own community. You can compare Kane County to other counties around the state. You can look at the total population that we have that's fully vaccinated, uh, as well as the amount of vaccine that's come into our community. So uh, if, you, if you're interested in tracking this kind of thing, I think this is a very good place to go. So what's coming up in, in the next few weeks with vaccine? Uh, a couple of areas that I would, would wanna draw to people's attention to. Uh, we do have a sign up where people can go and sign up to get our weekly registration. Uh, or they can register for a weekly newsletter where they can get updated information about where vaccine is available in the community. Uh, so I highly encourage people to do that. Also encourage people to go to our website, which is canehealth.com. Uh, again, I wanna acknowledge and, and just put it out there that right now we are not getting enough vaccine in our community. And so we're hearing and we understand frustration from people who say that they're going to the website uh, they're clicking on the links that we're putting out there for different providers and that there's not appointments available for people to sign up for. That is the truth right now. As more vaccine starts to come into our community, more appointments will become available and people will be able to utilize the different resources that we're making available so that they can get a vaccine. This is going to take several months. This is not something where we're going to be able to vaccinate the whole community in the next couple of weeks. This is going to take several months. Uh, so we're looking at getting into the summer before we get everybody fully vaccinated. Uh, also, we're working with specific populations. So over the last few weeks, we have been looking at first responders so that we're, again, taking care of the people who are taking care of us. Uh, we've been working with our schools so that families can feel uh, more comfortable sending their children to in-person schooling uh, so that staff in the schools can feel more comfortable that they're safe. 
Uh, we've been working with our shelters, uh, making sure that the staff there is, is protected, uh, as well as residents, again, because that's a higher risk situation when you're in a congregate setting. Uh, also, we're looking at larger employers that we may, as more vaccine becomes available, uh, be able to work with other partners, such as the pharmacies or the hospitals, to actually do on-site clinics for these places. Uh, in addition to these um, places that I've listed here, we're also working with um, senior centers. Um, so I mentioned the long-term care facility, uh, the national partnership with the pharmacies to go on site, uh, but we're also working, for example, with VNA Healthcare uh, here in Aurora, and they've been an outstanding partner where they have gone to Plum Landing. They're working with Constitution House. They're working with other places where seniors live where it makes more sense for us to just go on site and make vaccine available to people. Uh, we can cut out some of the frustration that people are having with registration. Uh, we can cut out issues that people may have with transportation and we can just readily get shots into people's arms. So again, this is slowly growing where we're, as more vaccine becomes available, we're getting to more locations so we can serve people. Uh, but we do have plans in place so that we'll be able to continue to ramp this up and expand how many places we're able to get vaccine to. Uh, also, as we look, we're, we're continuing to be hopeful that there's going to be increases not only in supply, but also in predictability. Uh, so in some presentations, we'll, we'll share all the data for uh, each week, how many, how many vaccines have arrived. Uh, and I can tell you over the last month or so, we've had two weeks uh, where we've received um, less than 5,000 doses. One week we received zero doses. Another week we received over 20,000 doses. So it's, it's not only hard to predict, but it's wildly inconsistent how much vaccine is coming into our community. Uh, so this is an area where for us to plan clinics out beyond uh, a week, it, it's, it's very challenging because we can't commit to that because we don't know if we're gonna have the vaccine available. Uh, so that's something that we frequently hear from the community is, well, why aren't you running ongoing clinics? Uh, because we can't commit to it. Uh, we don't want people to make appointments with us and then have to have their, their appointment canceled because we feel that uh, that would, would cause even more frustration. And we're worried that if somebody makes an appointment with us, they may turn down an opportunity to get a shot from their pharmacy or from their doctor if it becomes available. So we want people to be looking uh, for other opportunities so they can get themselves taken care of. Uh, also, we're working with a larger and larger number of providers. So again, this is, this is partially dependent on how much vaccine we get, but it's also uh, partially dependent on people being registered with the state um, so a provider for us to be able to give them vaccines so that they can administer it themselves, they have to be part of the statewide vaccine registry. Uh, here we call it eye care. Um, so they have to be part of that. And then they also have to be registered with the state as a COVID vaccine provider, which actually goes up and gets approved by the CDC. Um, so the number of providers that we have in Kane County, we have uh, well over 40 locations that have been approved. So when we get more vaccine, we're gonna be able to give to more locations. And ultimately our strategy in Kane County is to push as much vaccine out into the community as we can. So again, our plan was not to set up and run large clinics day after day, but rather to make sure that the vaccine gets out to your doctor's office, to make sure that the vaccine gets to your pharmacist, to make sure that the vaccine gets to the hospital near you so that you can get it in a place that you're comfortable with, that's close to your home, uh, again, so we can cut out transportation issues. Um, another thing that we're starting to do is direct ship to providers. So that saves us logistically. Uh, when this first started, all of the vaccine was coming directly to the Kane County Health Department uh, and, and or one of our sites where we then had to transport it or have these locations come and pick it up. Now we're able to have it shipped directly to the hospitals, to the pharmacies, to the clinics, uh, and that's making things move much, much more quickly. And that enables us to get vaccine out to people more quickly. Here's a screenshot of our website. So uh, this is a place where people can go for vaccine information. Uh, also, if you click in the upper right-hand corner is where you can see vaccine appoint vaccination appointments. This is where right now there's not a lot of appointments to be had. 
but this is going to be a very valuable place to go soon because more appointments will be available. So uh, please pay, I encourage you to, to visit our website and to, to look at these sites. And even if you visited and you have not been able to have an appointment, uh, I, I ask that, that is, if you just wait a little bit, uh, more vaccine will become available and it, it will be um, more shot uh, opportunities will come available to you. Um, just also seeing there's some videos, some additional information. Uh, here's another link to the dashboard so people can see that, uh, as well as information about the number of cases uh, that we have in the community. So if, if you're interested in that kind of data, that's all available on our website as well. So now I want to talk a little more about the vaccine itself, uh, because we're in this interesting, uh, we have two conflicting problems right now. One, we don't have enough vaccine and we, we literally have tens of thousands of people who want it. Uh, so that's an immediate issue that we're trying to solve. Uh, the second issue we have is we have people we want to be getting vaccinated who are choosing not to be vaccinated. So we need to balance educating people about the safety and the efficacy of these vaccines uh, to encourage them to get vaccinated, but also we need more supply so that we're not just uh, getting an interest for something that we don't currently have. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit about who should get the vaccine, how these vaccines specifically were developed, uh, some frequently asked questions that we hear, uh, talk specifically about some of the equity issues, uh, including with our African American and our Latinx community, not only how the vaccines were tested, uh, so that we could make sure that they work for everyone, but also what we're seeing in terms of disparities here in our community. Uh, a little bit of information about misinformation and scams that's out there. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about variants, and we want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So are these vaccines safe? Yes, they are. They're absolutely safe. Uh, we have had very few uh, reactions that we've seen in Kane County, and many of those have been people who've reported to us that either uh, they typically pass out or they didn't eat that day. Uh, we have not had much in the way of serious reactions. Uh, and across the country, if you look at the data, you'll see uh, that these vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine that are currently being administered, uh, have very high safety ratings. And they're 90 plus percent effective. So they protect you from serious illness, from hospitalization, uh, and from death. So getting vaccinated is excellent for protecting you um, from this disease. So who should get the vaccine? Well, eventually we're gonna want every adult to get it. Uh, anybody who's eligible, if you don't have a contraindication to the particular vaccines, meaning you're not allergic to it, uh, we don't want anybody just choosing not to get the vaccine. Uh, we understand people have hesitancy around vaccines, so we want to provide as much information to people as we can so that everyone can make the best choice for themselves. Uh, but ultimately, our goal is to make sure as much of the community gets vaccinated as is possible. Uh, and then as soon as you get the opportunity, we want people to get the vaccine. Uh, I have a lot of, of conversations with people about the vaccine and people say, well, which is better? Should I, should I get the Moderna or should I get the Pfizer? Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which we hope will become available in the next few weeks, uh, is a one-dose vaccine. So that makes it uh, a little bit easier. It's half as many shots that a person's going to get. So some people say, well, should I, should I just wait and get the Johnson & Johnson? Uh, the efficacy of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are, are higher than what we're seeing, at least so far in the studies from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, but I think for most of us, and, and I believe Dr. Fauci um, said this at the federal level, uh, the best vaccine is the vaccine you can get. So any of the three vaccines, the two that are currently available, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, when it becomes available, uh, any of those will be perfectly fine for protecting you from this illness. Uh, so just a little bit about vaccine development. That is one thing that we hear people say uh, that it causes them a little bit of concern is, well, how, and I think it's pretty miraculous that a year later, a year after this, this virus showed up uh, in our country, we already have vaccine when typically we've always talked about vaccines uh, taking several years to develop. 
Uh, there's so there's a couple things that are important to understand, and I think if we walk through the process of vaccine development, uh, hopefully it'll put people at ease so that they understand that these really are not only safe vaccines, but these are vaccines that have gone through a tremendous amount of research. Uh, so starting on the left, they start with what they call phase one, and that's really where they're looking at safety. So are there any serious things that happen when they're testing this vaccine on people? Again, you can see it's a very small group that they start with. Uh, are there serious side effects? Uh, how does the dose relate to any side effects that may occur? And is, is there an immediate immune response? Because that's what we're trying to do with a vaccine is really train our body's immune system so that the next time it encounters uh, a virus that, that the, this vaccine is protecting it against, in this case, uh, you know, we don't want to come down with COVID, uh, that our immune response is um, strong and that it is able to protect us. In the second phase, we get several hundred volunteers who come forward. And we, again, we're looking at the serious side effects that may be occurring. We're again checking to see what's the body's immune response. Uh, is this vaccine causing that response that we want to be seen? Uh, and we start to look at, is, there protect is this protective? So how effective is this vaccine at keeping someone from developing illness? Uh, then we move on to phase three where they get more people, so if over a thousand, and they have a couple of additional questions that they're trying to answer here. So uh, when you look at different types of people, uh, then you also can set up cohorts where you have people who've had the, vi the vaccine and people who have not had the vaccine. And your hope is, that uh, the people who have had the vaccine are much less likely to get the virus, which indeed is what we've been seeing. And then finally, you get to the stage where a vaccine is improved. So uh, currently we have, as I've mentioned, the two vaccines that have emergency use authorization. So they've been through the process and the FDA has said, yes, these are something that can be used under this emergency use authorization. Uh, because we want to get the vaccine to market as quickly as possible. Uh, but we are continuing to collect data about these vaccines now. And this is something that not only in the United States, but worldwide, we are collecting a tremendous amount of information every single day, not only because we have millions of people who've been vaccinated, so we're going to be able to see over time how well protected they are against the virus on a large scale, but also because so many people have COVID or have had COVID that we're able to really monitor that information as well to see what's the overall impact of increasing the, the vaccination rate. So uh, how were they developed so quickly? Less than a year, it seems, it seems too good to be true. Uh, I think there's a couple things that make this possible. One, we're, we're living in an age where, where scientific advancements are, are um, really going up um, astronomically every year. Um, but two, we were able to build on what we had already done. Um, so I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and then how do we know they're safe? Um, I'm gonna share a little bit more information about this. So we already had the, the coronaviruses are not new to us. Uh, we had SARS, uh, what, 15, 17 years ago, uh, where, where we dealt with that in our community. So having vaccines for coronaviruses is not something that's completely new. Uh, so we were able to build on existing trials that were already going on. And we also were able to speed up manufacturing um, to get it started while the clinical trials were going. So we had all the component pieces in place so that once the trials were completed, once we saw that the vaccine was safe, and once we saw that they were effective, we were able to start ramping up production. And that's underway now as we try to speed up how much vaccine we can get out. Uh, you may hear that the um, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are both what's called mRNA vaccines. Um, so that's messenger RNA, and that is how they um, train your body to respond. So they go in and they um, work within your immune system so that the next time your body comes in, or that if your body comes into contact with actual uh, coronavirus, uh, it's already seen that and can, can respond and hopefully attack it and knock it out so that you don't get any serious illness uh, or even any symptoms at all, hopefully. Uh, FDA and CDC are prioritizing review authorization and recommendations. So obviously this is the biggest thing that's been happening in the world for the past year. So the government has been 
uh, pushing this as, as quickly as they can. How do we know they're safe? This is an important question uh, for anyone who's getting vaccines, especially people who may be hesitant. Uh, this is one of their primary questions. We have a tremendous amount of data about these vaccines. Uh, both of the, these vaccines that we're currently using and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's coming up. Uh, so the emergency use authorization that I mentioned, uh, that's used when we see the benefits outrain any potential risks. Uh, but we have a lot of data that we've collected since the emergency use authorization uh, first occurred for these vaccines almost two months ago. Um, so it continues to be proven that they're safe and effective. Just a few slides about uh, health equity and disparities that we may see, and also the importance of having a vaccine that meets the needs of everyone. Uh, these vaccines really provided a lot of, um, they represented our community well. So you can see with the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the, the racial and ethnic uh, distribution, we had Latino, uh, Latinx, we had African-American, we had Asian and we have Native, Native Americans who participated. Uh, it was tested in 39 states and over 43,000 people in those initial um, trials received both the first and the second dose. Over with the Moderna, you can see over 25,000 people received the second dose. That was conducted in 32 states. And you can also see that we had uh, good representation from non-white populations so that we could make sure that this vaccine works for everyone. Uh, and what we saw is that it actually does work for, for everyone. Uh, so why is that important? Unfortunately, because of the way our society is set up and the types of jobs that many people have, uh, we continue to see tremendous high levels of disparities in COVID um, illness and in death. So this slide here shows uh, the orange bar is the percentage of cases that we've identified in Kane County uh, of COVID. And the blue bar is the percentage of um, the population that the particular group makes up. So for example, this top one, uh, the Latinx community makes up 32.2% of Kane County residents. Uh, so we have the highest percentage of, of Latinx um, residents in the whole state of Illinois, uh, a long rich history, uh, especially here in Aurora where we, where we have people from all over the world, a strong uh, uh, Mexican tradition, Puerto Rican tradition, people from South America. So we're, we're fortunate to have such, such diversity. Uh, but unfortunately, what this slide is showing us is while 32% of the people are Latinx, 46% uh, of the cases are in that population. Uh, this goes to a lot of factors that we see based on the type of work that people do. Uh, somebody who is uh, in the Latinx population or the African-American population is more likely to have a job where they actually have to go and do that work in person. They are in manufacturing, they are in grocery stores, they are in the food production line. Uh, whereas our, our white population is more likely to be in a position where maybe they were able to work from home part of the time. So again, I'm, those are general statements. Certainly we have people from, from all races and ethnicities doing all kinds of jobs. But when we look at the overall data, we can see that there's tremendous disparity. Uh, this is showing us in illness. And likewise, if I go down to the white population, 57% of the population is white and only 41% of the cases uh, are occurring in the white population. For the African-American population, uh, in terms of the number of cases, uh, they're actually doing a little better, uh, but as I'll show you in a future slide, uh, serious illness and death is where we're seeing some disparities with the African-American population. The Asian, Asian population also uh, representing about 5% of the Kane County residents, uh, but only 3%, 3.2% of the cases. So that's pretty good. And then in the other, which we're starting to see more of, and this could be two or more races, et cetera, uh, that's 3.7% of our cases. Um, so I do wanna point out that this data was updated just this week. And this represents for the cases that we know uh, the race and or ethnicity for the person. Uh, we still have a lot of cases where we don't necessarily know uh, because that was not reported to us. So incidence rate is something that we look at to measure population level health. 
Uh, so this slide shows that the number of cases, if we equalized it out over 100,000 people, uh, you could see that the uh, in the black population, it's slightly higher than the white population, but pretty close. Uh, but the, the Latinx population is significantly higher uh, with almost a uh, person in the, that's Latinx would be twice as likely to get COVID um, in the last year than somebody who was, was not uh, Latinx. Looking at deaths, almost 60% of the deaths have occurred in the white population. 31% uh, in the Latinx population, 7% in the African American population, and 3% in the Asian population. This is not too different than what our makeup is for our community. Uh, but when we look here at deaths for people who are under 60, over on the right hand side, uh, the Latinx population makes up almost 70% of the deaths for people under six, 60 years of age. Uh, so there's a tremendous disparity there. And when we look over here at hospitalizations, the, the gray piece of the pie here is showing that our African-American population is having higher levels of hospitalizations and higher levels of death uh, for people 60 years and younger. Uh, so again, as I mentioned at the beginning, that's part of the reason why in Illinois we lowered the age to 65 and over, uh, because we were seeing deaths at younger ages in these two populations. So what to expect when it's your turn to get the vaccine? Uh, it's important for you to, to spend some time learning about the vaccine so you can make a good informed decision. Again, they're very safe, they're very effective, but we want you to have the information so you can make that decision for yourself. Uh, we wanna see when it gets to your group uh, that you have the opportunity to get vaccine. Right now is a frustrating time where we don't have enough vaccine, but I can assure you every day, this is gonna continue to get better. During the time when it's your time, uh, you're gonna get the opportunity to read a fact sheet. So once you make an appointment to get a vaccine, you will be able to read about the particular vaccine that you're getting. You'll be able to talk with your provider if you have any questions about any health conditions you may have. Uh, you'll get a record card because again, for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, they're both two dose vaccines. So you're gonna have the opportunity to come back for your second dose. And your protection, the full protection that the vaccine provides really doesn't start until about two weeks after your second dose. So we're not encouraging people to only get one dose. If you get the first dose, we want you to get the second dose as well. And you may find when you go to get vaccinated uh, that, you're, that we're gonna ask you to stick around for 15 or 30 minutes, depending on your health condition, uh, just so we can monitor you to make sure that you don't have any adverse effects. Uh, afterwards, you're going to need two shots. Like I said, there are going to be some side effects. Uh, these vaccines are stimulating your immune system. So for people to feel uh, a little bit uh, under the weather is not abnormal. And it actually means that the vaccine is working. Uh, you'll get an opportunity to enroll, enroll in a national V-SAVE program uh, where we can track and build that evidence base around uh, our entire community to see who, who is having um, side effects from the vaccine. And again, thus far, we're not seeing um, much in the way of side effects. Uh, and then this is a very important point. We want you to continue taking precautions because it's important that all of us understand the vaccines have been tested to protect the person who's vaccinated. Even if I'm fully vaccinated, I still could get COVID. I, I shouldn't get sick. I shouldn't have to go to the hospital. I may not have any symptoms. But it's still possible for me to, to pass that virus on to someone else. So even though I'm, I'm vaccinated myself, I still need to take precautions. We expect as more people become vaccinated and as we get more people in the community uh, who are, so we start to get that herd immunity, uh, that, that the vaccine will really be doing its full job where it's not only protecting you, but it's also reducing transmission. And part of this is we want to make sure that everything we're saying is based on fact. And we're still gathering all the facts and gathering all the data about how well these vaccines work to stop a person who's vaccinated from giving the, the illness to someone else. Uh, so we're, we're comfortable that that's where we're gonna end up, but we wanna make sure we have that information first. A couple of things to watch out for. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So we encourage you to get information. Again, this is an ongoing 
developing thing. People ask, am I going to need uh, a shot every year like the flu shot? We don't know yet. We, we need more time to be able to study this. Uh, people are asking about whether or not um, we'll be back to normal in the summer. We don't know. T time will tell as we get more people vaccinated. We need enough people vaccinated so that we can more quickly get back to normal. Uh, but some of this is just going to take time. We want people to watch out for scams and fraud. So we are working with our libraries. We're working with our townships. We're working with Senior Service Association and Age Guide and many other organizations who work with seniors uh, who may struggle with technology uh, so that they have a safe place where they can call and get help registering. Uh, certainly, most people's healthcare providers and the hospitals have phone systems set up as well uh, so that they can help people. We don't want people um, getting information from people or giving information to strangers about themselves. Uh, this vaccine is free, so you should not have to be paying anyone out of pocket for the vaccine. Uh, so we just want to make sure that people have the information and that they're going someplace that they know and that they trust, not only for information, but also for the vaccine. Uh, and then there's a lot of misinformation. We all know this that, that circulates on social media. So we want to make sure that people uh, are going to trusted, reliable sources to get their information. Uh, again, with the caveat that this is going to continue to develop. So as we learn more, it doesn't mean that if we say something new, uh, that we didn't know in November, that we were wrong in November. We're just continuing to learn about this and we'll continue to put out the most current information we have. So a couple of different places where someone can go for information uh, at the national level, there's the Center for Disease Control, the Illinois Department of Public Health for um, the state level has a very good page, and then the Kane County Health Department, uh, as I already mentioned. And then patients, one of the groups that we work with, Age Guide, uh, they, they say, uh, be patient, be kind, and be ready. So understand that this is going to take time, but we want people to, to understand they are going to get a vaccine. It is going to come. It is going to be available to you. Um, so we just, we just want everybody to have realistic expectations about the timing for this. Uh, and then it's, it's good that you have the information ahead of time so that you're ready. Um, so vaccine will increase, appointments will be available, uh, and then please sign up to get the uh, vaccine information from us. And then I also just want to point out there's still something that is um, getting a lot of people's attention, which is the different variants that are occurring around the world. Uh, this is something that we are testing for here in Illinois. Uh, just, just last week in, in Lake County, they identified one of the variants showing up. Uh, so we are looking at it. We are, uh, for all the samples that we submit, uh, they are being tested. So if these variants start to show up, we'll share that information with the public. Uh, it's not completely known what the impact of different variants will be. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not they're spread more easily, whether they cause more serious illness. Uh, it's completely natural for viruses to continue to mutate uh, and change. That's what they do. Uh, so as more information becomes available, we will make sure that we're sharing that. Um, but because of these variants coming out, I think it's, it's another good opportunity for us just to remind people that we need to be taking these smart steps. Uh, and just a couple, a couple of reminders. Um, make sure that you're wearing a, a face covering. Make sure that you're wearing it appropriately. You can see here's a simple checklist that the Centers for Disease Control has. A uh, couple layers of fabric offers more protection. Uh, we do want people to breathe without uh, restriction though, so that's important. Uh, and it's important to either dispose of, of your face coverings uh, or if you have one that's washable to make sure that you're washing it. We want it to fit snugly to your face so that when you're breathing, you're not breathing out or breathing in someone else's germs. Uh, and the social distancing is another thing. Um, so we know that staying apart from people, even though it's made it very challenging over the last year for us to, to be away from, from friends and from loved ones, uh, keeping that social distance is very effective at, at preventing the virus from spreading. Also wearing the face covering, like I said, wear your mask, watch your distance and wash your hands. Um, even after you're vaccinated, we're going to ask that you continue to do these things to protect not only yourself, 
uh, but your loved ones, people in your community. And with that, I will stop my presentation and we can open it up for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. That was so much really, really valuable information about the availability, where we're at in King County and the safety and um, and what to expect. And that's really, really helpful. So we do have quite a few questions. So I'm going to start with what I received early through email. Um, some of them have been answered, some of them haven't. So first of all, um, the White House COVID response team announced on Friday, February or on February 2nd, that it would be delivering more vaccines directly to pharmacies tomorrow, February 11th. Are any pharmacies in Kane County receiving those? Great question. So uh, one thing that's a little bit of a complicating factor for us is we don't get direct information about the uh, vaccine that goes straight from the federal government to our pharmacies. So it's a positive that we're getting more vaccine into the community, but we don't necessarily know when those shipments are occurring. So we do know that we've had, uh, because we are in close contact with our pharmacy, so we do know that they're starting to get them, uh, but just on an ongoing basis, as more and more pharmacies get it, we're, we're not gonna uh, necessarily have up-to-date information on that all the time. Okay, thank you. The, um, and that I am assuming is the same for community health centers in King County. So currently all of the vaccine that's going to the community health centers is, is being ordered by the health department. So right now we do know how much uh, is going to our federally qualified health centers and our clinics and our hospitals. Uh, currently it's only the pharmacies who are getting the direct shipments from the state. Okay, great, thank you. And, um, you know, so there's kind of a concern about the lack of um, the lack of vaccine availability. So um, why does it why is it such a low amount of availability? And it seems as if our neighboring counties, DuPage, you know, for instance, or Cook, seems to be getting enough to have mass vaccination clinics and and to get a higher percentage of the population vaccinated faster. Sure. No, that's that's a really good question. Uh, I think it's pretty universal that that our our neighboring um, communities are not getting the vaccine that they need. Uh, so uh, in DuPage County, for example, I, I saw in the news last evening that they only got 10,000 doses uh, this week. So they have a, a million people in DuPage County. Uh, that 10,000 doses is not going to go very far. Um, so I think in terms of why are we not getting as much and doing the mass clinics, Part of it is our strategy. So we are really focused on getting vaccine out to our community partners, as opposed to putting a big focus on us as the health department running clinics. Uh, but if you look at the statistics uh, that are available on the uh, Illinois Department of Public Health website, you'll see that Kane County is, is pretty close uh, to where some of these other communities are. Mm -hmm. And as we've increased our daily output, uh, I think that you'll see that those differences are, are are going to be pretty minimal. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, okay. So, and, and I guess that also answers another bunch of questions that we received about the centralized um, appointment system. So is there any time where there will be a centralized registration system via the health department or it's going to usually be yeah, so if, if it's a clinic that the health department is managing, people will be able to register through the health department. Uh, but otherwise, as we were, and this again, this will be the same in other communities as well. CVS has a different system than Rush Copley has, which is different than the VNA has. Um, so every organization does have a different system. It does add complexity to the, to the whole process, which we appreciate. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but I hope that that complexity is is offset by the fact that we're able to get more vaccine to more people. Okay, thank you. Um, another concern that it has come up a couple times is that um, in that group one a the um, long congregate care facilities are those or I think that's group one b. Are those consider? Does that include um, independent living for seniors? Um, and so, yeah, good question. I'm sorry to interrupt, but independent living, if it's not a skilled nursing facility or a long-term care facility, uh, those independent living facilities 
the residents, if they're over 65, do qualify as being in 1B. And that's one of those areas where we've started working with our partners like VNA Healthcare to actually go on site and administer mm -hmm. vaccines. So we have done that with several uh, of the larger independent living facilities in the county. And as the weeks go by, we'll continue to serve more. Awesome. Do you, do you have a time frame for for that? It, it's it's yeah. all dependent on how much vaccine we get. So mm -hmm. if, if we got 50,000 doses next week, uh, we would be able to serve a lot more people. But if we only right. get 3,000, uh, that, that puts a crunch on our timeline. Right. Okay. Um, does somebody, this is about a little bit more specific, does someone who works in a warehouse, shipping in particular, fall into group 1B? They were deemed essential employees back in March. Yeah, so I think that's an important point I should clarify. Uh, back in the spring when we talked about who is essential and who should remain open, uh, that's a little bit different than the priority groups that we have right now. So right now we're really looking at the, the frontline people in these positions. Um, so there's actually essential workers that are in 1B and there's essential workers that are not going to be served until 1C. Uh, and currently some of the language we have is for warehouses that they're in 1C, but we're always having discussions with the state and, and talking about people moving, uh, moving up in those priorities. It, as I mentioned, it's just happened today. Okay. Okay. So, um, when you say it will take several months to get everyone vaccinated, do you mean all King County residents or or just 1A and 1B or which? Yeah, again, it's dependent. All of the timeline questions are dependent on the amount of vaccine that we can get. Okay. Um, so we do have a lot of resources where we can get vaccine to people quickly. Uh, so if the, if the supply increases, we'll be able to get more people served more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm looking at and, and the projections that I have are how, how can we get 280,000 people um, that are, that's about 70% of the adult population vaccinated um, by early summer. That would be if we were doing around uh, 3,200 um, shots a day. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go much quicker than that. So if the vaccine supply increases, uh, we'll be able to get people vaccinated much sooner. Okay, and what is being actively done to increase how much of the vaccine is received? Other states seem to be doing much better. Yeah, that's an interesting question about uh, what can be done. So I know at the local level, uh, Kane County uh, Board Chairman uh, Kareen uh, Pirog has been talking to the governor's office uh, almost every day, asking for more vaccine. I know the governor's office is working uh, with the, the administration at the federal level to get more vaccine into Illinois. Um, so there's, there's a lot of steps and I don't, I don't know exactly uh, where all the vaccine goes from the manufacturer to the federal level to the state level um, until it eventually reaches us. Uh, there definitely seem to be some kinks in that system as, as the, the questioner mentions uh, when you compare us to other states, but, but I'm, not, I'm not aware of exactly what the slowdown is. Okay, thanks. Um, and then this one, um, you know, sort of just to clarify, I think something that you already talked about, but um, why have you outsourced scheduling to pharmacies? Why are we using this different technique of, de of decentralized, no massive clinics? I think you mentioned transportation and comfort with your um, community you know, partners that we are familiar with as people and citizens. Could you talk a little bit more about that to answer some more questions? Sure, and when this first started, we weren't sure how quickly the state was gonna switch over to direct shipping to providers. Uh, so this could happen any time where the state starts just sending it to hospitals, just like they would any other vaccine, uh, where people can just order it and get it. So as we look at that, we're prepared for that transition to take place. Uh, there's a lot of talk, and I think it's, it's important, and they're good points to look at the percentages of the vaccines that have been administered. Uh, but when we get the vaccine, we administer all of it. So it's not that we are um, unable with our plan to get vaccine to people, we are using all of the vaccine we get, we're getting it into people's arms. Uh, so for example, my, my friends in DuPage County, and they're doing a fantastic job, they have a higher percentage because they've received more vaccine. Mm -hmm. If we receive more vaccine, our percentage is going to go up. Mm -hmm. And they've received more pretty much because the population is higher, right? Correct. Right. 
Okay. Um, and why doesn't Kane County update its information on weekends? Why doesn't uh, Kane County show the death demographics and case demographics on the website? Okay, great question. And I, I think that's, that's uh, actually, I think that's a very good question. And that's something that I think uh, we're constantly uh, discussing and exploring. Part of it's when we get the data from the state, uh, but we wanna make sure people are getting the information they need. So uh, if, if I can share my contact information, it, I'd be happy to talk to somebody offline about that in more detail. Okay, um, how long does the vaccine last? And will this be a yearly shot? Right, that's another great question. We, we don't know currently. So just as we don't know if I've had COVID, how long do I have natural protection? We look at 90 days is typically what we're saying. Some of the new research is saying that they think people may have natural protection then for up to six months, uh, but we don't know because the virus hasn't been around long enough uh, and the vaccine has been around even less time. So uh, we don't know yet until we're a year into this, whether or not it's something that we're gonna need like a flu shot uh, or if we can all get vaccinated and really knock this thing back. Uh, and the variants are going to be another uh, variable just in terms of how much of the virus is floating around in the community. Okay, great. Um, so um, this one is, again, might be a reiteration, a reiteration of things said earlier, um, but this one says, as a person who's been isolating for 11 months, wearing two masks, social distancing, I think I have been very patient. It is impossible to get a vaccine appointment with local pharmacies in King, and not at all King County, as we've talked about. Please explain earlier statements that King County was taking a conservative approach to vaccine rollout. Sure, and I don't mean in any way, and, and I apologize if I, if I didn't communicate it effectively. The, we're not taking a conservative approach with the rollout. As soon as we get the vaccine, we're administering it in the community. Uh, we're taking a conservative approach in the sense that we're not scheduling people for appointments mm -hmm. that we think we may have to cancel. Right. So, so that's where we're, we're being a little more cautious is I don't want to give somebody an appointment for February 18th unless I know I'm going to have vaccine. And mm -hmm. right now we find out on Wednesdays, uh, we find out how much vaccine we're going to have for the following week. Um, so it's literally a week by week basis that we're able to do this. Uh, and I see a question about people who are homebound or, or senior facilities. We are vaccinating on site at these facilities. Uh, obviously, we can't do all of them at once because we don't have enough vaccine. But as more vaccine comes, and I, I apologize if I sound like a broken record, uh, but as more vaccine comes, we are going to be able to go on site. We do have partnerships with pharmacies that are willing to do this. We do have partnerships with the hospitals that are willing to do this. We do have partnerships with the federally qualified healthcare centers. Uh, so for these, these centers, uh, I see in this question talking about a specific location, mm -hmm. uh, we are able to go on site once we get the vaccine. Okay, okay, great. And is that something that um, residents of those facilities should connect with their, their the facility management, right? To I think that's a great idea, absolutely. Okay, um, a couple more, and we have one um, that I think hasn't been answered yet in Zoom and then one on Facebook. So what percent of King County needs to be vaccinated for King County to be considered safe? Yeah, that's a, a here's another uh, kind of pat answer, but we don't know yet. So um, we, we simply nationally, internationally, we don't know with this particular virus what the exact percentage is. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the statistic of 70%. I'm using that as a planning uh, number, uh, but we need more information um, nationally to really know what, what's going to give us herd immunity. Okay, great. And just to reiterate, did you say that the effectiveness of the vaccine may only be 90 days to six months? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. That was in reference to if you've actually had COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So if you've been sick with COVID uh, and then you're exposed to somebody, Typically, we assume that for those 90 days after your illness that you don't have to worry about getting sick again. Uh, and what we're seeing with some of the other research is that you may have protection for up to six months. Uh, but again, that's all developing. But that's if you've been sick, not nothing to do with the vaccine. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, on Facebook, we have a question. Will we be able to request which vaccine we want? I don't really want the Johnson & Johnson when it becomes available. Yeah, I think that's based on which provider you go to. So if you go to a clinic, uh, you can find out ahead of time which vaccine they have, and then you certainly have the choice 
Uh, for example, at the clinics that the health department's been managing, we've been using Moderna. If you'd rather have Pfizer than Moderna, uh, then you may not want to come to one of our clinics. You may want to go to one of the hospitals that we've been, been giving Pfizer to or one of the pharmacies. Uh, but when you make your appointments, you should be able to get that information. So you do have a choice. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I think the rest of the questions have been answered unless you see one that or some that have not. Uh, no, I think a lot of it is just that that it's it's frustrating right now because it's hard to get appointments. Uh, the health department is going to be scheduling additional clinics in the community, so there will be new opportunities uh, that we're going to be announcing shortly. We do have agreements in place with locations all over the community for us to set up clinics, either for ourselves or for our partners. Um, so again, it, when the vaccine becomes available to us, we are going to be pushing it out and it is going to be easier for people to make appointments. Uh, but I completely understand the frustration and I, this is not a Kane County specific thing. Uh, and I think, and again, I, I work very closely with our, our partners in the neighboring communities. Uh, but I think having a clinic where people go, um, it gives the impression of a, of a lot of vaccine um, being administered. Whereas when it's administered in, in many smaller places, you don't see all of it. Uh, so I think that's an issue that we just need to communicate better here in Kane County, how much work is actually going on and how many people are actually administering vaccines uh, because it's comparable to what's happening uh, around the Chicagoland area. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this. This was very informative. And thanks to everyone for tuning in and asking your questions. And um, I think that for more information, you can always check out the Kane County Health Department website. Also, Michael mentioned the Illinois Department ID. What is it? That? Illinois Department of Public Health. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and also the library website, the royalpubliclibrary.org. We do have pages for COVID, um, just general COVID information, including vaccine information for uh, individuals and for businesses and uh, general, all the information you'll need. So um, make sure you keep your library in mind too. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, Michael. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Have a nice night.